thanks very much to ABES for the uh, invitation to, to come here and uh, speak today. Um, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, let's see how we're going with this system. Good. Um, look, being asked to speak about China, China ag China's agriculture and uh, its impact on trade uh, with Australia and agricultural opportunities is, is a fairly um, challenging job because it's hard to say anything that's new or interesting on the subject. Uh, I put up the growth figures uh, uh, just now of the last several decades under the reform and open door policy, just to remind us how dramatic that story is. But it's a very, a very much a, uh, a textbook story and I tend to find so much that happens in China does tend to be uh, textbook uh, economics. So the story is quite simple. Uh, economic growth has been very strong, per capita incomes have risen, um, and as per capita incomes rise, given the di diff differential elasticities of demand for different types of food, so after a certain uh, level of income per capita, uh, demand for high protein, high value added foods, uh, you know, dairy, meats and so on, uh, rises more rapidly than demand for staples, and that opens up you know, great opportunities for Australia, which is so competitive in supplying uh, those goods. And China, with its population and, and so on, is very limited in its su uh, supply response. So that's the that's a simple story, and in a sense we all know that. And so this morning I'll just go through uh, some of that in a little more uh, detail. Firstly, though, on the question of China's uh, economic growth and the outlook uh, for China's growth, um, the there's a lot of pessimism around the Chinese economy of late, and I think it's just very much relative to where China has been over the, uh, the, last, um, the last decade. I should say that, um, although I've got precise numbers here, uh, Chinese uh, economic growth figures are anything but precise, and I always find it amusing when markets move on a, on a basis point or two's change. Uh, often the people who are moving the markets are exactly the same people who say that China's statistics are completely unreliable. So we are somewhere in a 7% uh, growth range for the Chinese economy. It is slower than it has been, but there's a lot still going on in this uh, economy. For a start, 7% plus, uh, as Alan said, is coming off the base of the second biggest economy in the world. In the eight years that I've lived in China, the um, Chinese economy has doubled in, in size. So 7% plus of uh, that base translates into probably a growth rate of 12% plus uh, in terms of its impact on demand for commodities and, and food. There's also a lot of structural change going on in the Chinese economy. Uh, just uh, in 2013, for the first time ever, services became the biggest sector in the Chinese economy, uh, exceeding industrial uh, output, uh, something like 46% of GDP is now services compared to 44%, uh, 44 which is uh, uh, from industry. So uh, this is a big change and it does suggest that consumption uh, will continue to drive, uh, will in increasingly drive growth in the economy. However, um, I think the, the old investment-led growth model still has a long way to run and that's because there's still a great deal of uh, uh, of poverty left in the economy, in the country. Uh, many, many areas of China are still very underdeveloped and there's something like 300 million people uh, who will move into, into China's, um, China's cities over the next uh, 15 years or so. Uh, all of that uh, will uh, be sustained by uh, continuing uh, uh, investment growth uh, along the old uh, investment-led uh, model. Uh, this graph just shows you some uh, uh, forecasts uh, for uh, China's uh, growth and the outlook. And what it does point to is very strong con uh, growth continuing and that uh, China will become the biggest economy in the world by any, any single measure. So uh, in my sort of uh, helicopter overview at the start, uh, as I said, the, the main factors driving demand for food in China are obviously rising income, a growing middle class, rapid urbanization, and of course with that comes great social change and change in lifestyles. Um, and also uh, China has uh, invested enormously over the last two decades in transport uh, infrastructure, which enables uh, regional specialization 
and efficiency uh, coming from uh, comparative, uh, uh, realizing comparative advantage of China's uh, different regions. So as, as uh, the textbook would predict, uh, we've seen uh, uh, per capita consumption uh, taper off with respect to uh, basic staples, increase strongly uh, for uh, meat uh, and other forms of uh, protein, aquatic products. Uh, dairy uh, is starting to, uh, to rise strongly, uh, albeit uh, uh, domestic demand, uh, demand for domestic dairy has tapered off uh, because of uh, a series of food scandals, and that demand has shifted, as we know, uh, quite strongly into uh, demand for imports and uh, fruit and vegetables. The alcoholic drinks, interesting. Uh, you may have seen the, the movie Red about um, uh, the growing fashion uh, to consume red wine in China. Uh, there is a big change in consumption patterns reflecting a greater sophistication of the middle, class, um, middle classes in China. But the other day, someone in the dairy industry here in Australia was asking me about whether you know, China will become a major consumer of cheese. And I said, yes, it's just um, cheese is a lagged uh, indicator behind red wine. So where red wine goes, cheese will follow in a few years. Uh, as mentioned, the, 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 the demand for staples grew strongly uh, when economic growth and incomes took off uh, and then uh, basically uh, uh, plateaued. There is a strong push, though, uh, in China to try and maintain high levels of self-sufficiency, and I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Uh, milk and meat, as we've discussed, uh, have all risen uh, quite strongly, and you can expect uh, to see demand uh, continuing to grow more quickly in these areas of protein uh, than uh, for other, other foodstuffs. Uh, interestingly enough, whilst uh, pork is a basic, um, a basic staple in, in China, uh, reflecting the relatively low income per capita, and this is another point that needs to be brought in mind, China's per capita income is, is still only about 16% of US per capita income. So you're still looking at consumption patterns shifting in still a very poor uh, economy. Uh, pork will continue to be a major uh, food uh, source way into, the, way into the future. And uh, this graph uh, uh, shows some projections. So whilst in Australia we're seeing a big interest and a big demand uh, by uh, China for uh, imports of beef, uh, that um, uh, re reflects only or represents only a relatively small uh, share of China's total demand uh, for, for foods. Um, I'm conscious that uh, the minister's coming shortly. So uh, just to move on then to uh, the outlook for Australia, we see great opportunity in um, uh, in the higher value added uh, sources of uh, protein. Uh, there will still be opportunities uh, in wheat, uh, but um, uh, demand for those products will not grow as quickly as for the others. The um, signing of the FTA uh, between Australia and China uh, will open up uh, great opportunity for Australia's trade. The significance of it in the first instance is that it will begin to uh, level the playing field. Some of our uh, competitors have got uh, FTAs with China and have had them for many years. Um, we will, over the next four to five years, uh, be, we will see the removal of, our, uh, of tariffs on our imports in China, and most tariffs on most foodstuffs will go down to zero over the next four or five years, and also that will include wine, and that will level the playing field with, um, with uh, uh, our competitors. Uh, a very significant development, I think, that we're becoming aware of as China looks around the world to try and uh, secure its food supplies, uh, it is going to become an ever-increasing uh, investor uh, overseas, and we're seeing increased Chinese interest in investing in Australia. That investment uh, will come increasingly uh, from private sector firms. Indeed, the thrust of Chinese domestic policy now is to promote uh, what they call multiple forms of ownership, but in the third plenum of uh, the uh, Party Congress in November 2012, uh, it was said that the private sector would be on the same level as the state sector, and that is the first time ever that that has been uh, set down as policy in China, and that markets will be the decisive factor driving uh, economic growth. Uh, and so this is a big change, and we will see 
uh, an ever-increasing uh, private sector uh, going offshore and investing in uh, major uh, agricultural uh, activities. Uh, this, of course, should be very much welcome um, in Australia. Uh, it will uh, help to increase uh, rural incomes and certainly it will be uh, a way of, um, of, of uh, accessing the Chinese market as most of these investments will basically involve offtake arrangements. Um, so we can look forward to continuing strong growth in China, continuing strong growth in per capita incomes, um, continuing um, uh, shift of demand for uh, imported foods uh, to higher, higher valued protein sources, uh, increasing demand for sugar. Uh, sugar will be um, uh, increasingly consumed and China's per capita sugar consumption is still way, way below uh, developed country levels reflecting China's low per capita income. The FTA uh, will make a significant contribution in opening up market access for Australia into, um, into China um, and Chinese private firms will become increasing sources of investment in Australian agriculture as, uh, as uh, they seek to supply uh, this ever-growing market. Uh, thank you very much.